If you've seen this man in your dreams, I have some bad news. So this is Hatman, and he is one of the most commonly seen sleep paralysis demons in the entire world. And here's how you know if you're about to see him. First, you'll wake up in the middle of the night and you won't be able to move at all. Like you'll feel completely paralyzed. Next, you'll feel a crushing feeling on your chest like something is sitting on it. And when this happens, it's going to be very hard to breathe. And at that point, there's nothing you can do. That's when Hatman comes into your room. Many doctors believe that Hatman is just a fragment of people's imaginations, but a lot of people think that he's shown up in photos like this one, or this eerie one that was taken on the day of these women's mother's funeral. In the next part, I'm gonna read some stories of people who believe they've seen him. If you see him while you're awake, run. So this story actually comes from a Reddit user who's a therapist. And this user had a patient who was coming in complaining of seeing Hatman at night. This patient would apparently wake up in the middle of the night to see Hatman standing at the foot of their bed, watching them sleep. And as a result, they were not really sleeping much. So the therapist prescribed some pretty heavy sleeping medication. And as a result, the patient starts getting a little better. But then one day the patient comes in and just looks like they had seen a ghost. So the therapist asked them what was wrong and they said that as they were getting in the car to come to therapy, they saw Hatman standing across the street during the day. This therapist had only ever heard of Hatman when it came to patients waking up in the middle of the night and seeing him, never when they were already awake doing things in the middle of the day. So the patient is terrified, but the therapist thinks this might be a side effect of the medication. It takes a little while to get used to. But that was the last time the patient ever came to see the therapist. Do you know about the Harry Potter actor that got sent to prison? You may remember Jamie Waylett, who played the Hogwarts bully Vincent Crabbe in the Harry Potter films. Although for many actors, this would be a dream come true to be in such well-known films, Jamie reportedly struggled with the fame. He began to use substances in order to cope with his mental health struggles. In 2012, London saw some of the most devastating riots, including Luton and arson, as well as the deaths of five people. Jamie was arrested for being involved in the riots. He was pictured getting involved in looting and holding a bottle full of petrol. He was also with a gang of at least four people who went into Chalk Farm on the 8th of August. He also had a previous conviction for substance possession at that time. In 2012, he received a two-year sentence for violent disorder and 12 months for handling stolen goods. It's believed that since being released from prison, he hasn't been in any big films. So you may have seen the TikTok that I made exposing this pedophile Gary Glitter for his crimes that he committed. But I have some really unfortunate news. After just serving half of his sentence, he was just released from prison in the UK. That means that this man, who was found with thousands of images of CP and was convicted of assaulting two young girls in a foreign country, is now free. Gary Glitter is a notorious musician. If you don't know, he wrote the song Rock and Roll, which is played at football games and other sporting events, and was featured in the movie The Joker in 2019. But his life has been mired with controversy. This guy has assaulted multiple kids and he was found, like I said before, with CP materials on his computer. But thankfully, people in the UK are putting up a fuss about him being released from prison. There were actually some riots and protests outside of the hostel that he was released to. But even the family that lives next door to the hostel has gone to the news and said they're concerned because they're now living next to Gary Glitter and they know what he did. So what do you think? Did he serve his time? Is he a reformed man or should he still be incarcerated? Let me know below. This man killed his brother for not thanking him for cooking dinner. It was the 7th of March, 2003 in Wainiamata, New Zealand. A family meal was underway. 36 year old Fergus Glenn had made dinner at his parents' house. One of the people he had cooked for was his 33 year old brother, Craig. Craig was a family man with a wife and three children. It's believed that the pair had an ongoing feud and on the day in question, Craig not thanking Fergus for cooking appeared to be the final straw. That evening, Craig went to sleep unaware of the horrors that would unfold. Shortly after, his mum woke to the sound of blows coming from the room that Craig was sleeping in. She initially thought this sound sounded like a wood chipper. She got up to investigate and found Fergus on the stairs. He calmly told his mum, I've done him with an axe. Fergus had chillingly struck his brother eight times with the weapon. It is likely that Craig knew very little about the attack. Experts claimed that it would be likely that the first strike would have killed him straight away or at least knocked him unconscious. 
Later in 2003, Fergus pleaded guilty in court. He was sentenced to a lifetime term with a minimum of 10 years. A woman from Northern Ireland vanished under mysterious circumstances. Now her family have shared this eerie photo to bring attention to her unsolved case. Lisa Dorian was 25 years old when she vanished on the 27th of February 2005. Lisa was from Bangor and she was last seen in Bally Halbert Caravan Park. During that time, she was with someone called Mark Lover, who was 17 at the time. It's believed that they were both drunk at this point and had been taking substances, causing them to experience hallucinations. When Mark was questioned by police after the woman disappeared, he stated that around 4.45 a.m. they were startled by noises and flashing lights. Both terrified, he said they ran off in different directions and he never saw her again. Police believed that Lisa was murdered and they have endlessly tried to find her remains. Tragically for this family, they have had no luck and no closure in this case. Her family have released this eerie photograph of the last place she was before she went missing to try and provoke the conscience of whoever may have killed her. There have been more than 400 confidential tips throughout the years, but nothing leading to the discovery of Lisa's body or remains. A £20,000 reward has been offered by Crime Stoppers for anyone who could provide any information leading to either the arrest or conviction of those responsible. A real life devil in disguise. Abigail Wyatt was an OnlyFans model, also known as Fake Barbie. Last year, she murdered her boyfriend. Bradley Lewis, 22, was also the father of Abigail's three children. The couple have been having arguments and she said at one point she managed to beat the truth out of him after suspecting him of cheating. The couple had been getting into arguments and Bradley had been living with his mother. They were at the park on March 25th, 2022 with their children when Bradley told Abigail he no longer wanted to be with her. That night, they got into an argument at home and Abigail grabbed a knife from the kitchen and plunged it straight into Bradley's heart. Abigail then began screaming hysterically, which alerted one of the neighbours who came round and found Bradley laying on the floor. She dialed 999 and started CPR. Bradley was rushed to hospital, but sadly died the next day from a single stab wound to his chest. A post-mortem showed a seven centimetre deep wound straight into his heart. Abigail was arrested and she told police that they got into an argument and Bradley had grabbed the knife from the kitchen. She said that she took it off him, went to the front of the house and she was going to throw it outside when Bradley came towards her, grabbed her hands and made it seem as if she'd plunged the knife into his chest. She told them that the wound was 100% self-inflicted by Bradley. Abigail pleaded not guilty, but police found voice notes on her phone, some of which were saying that she was capable of killing him and saying that the only way to get the truth out of him was to threaten his life. Abigail was found guilty and sentenced to life with a minimum of 18 years. Shockingly, she's actually managed to find a new boyfriend from behind bars and is asking prison officers to give her conjugal visits with her new man. These are pictures with the most disturbing backstories, part five. This is Travis the Chimp, and he lived with Sandra and Jerome Harold since he was a young chimp and was often treated like a member of the family. However, one day he exhibited unusually aggressive behavior which made the Heralds call their friend Nash for assistance. But when Nash arrived at the Heralds' home, Travis the Chimp suddenly attacked her. And the attack was extremely gruesome. Travis the Chimp targeted Nash's face and hands. It ripped off both of her eyelids and then proceeded to rip her nose clean off, blinding her and also severing several parts of her body and lacerating her face. Travis the Chimp was then shot and killed by police who arrived at the scene. Nash's injuries were so severe that she underwent a face transplant and lost both of her hands in an attempt to save her life. But miraculously, she would pull through. I would show you pictures of the attack, but they're extremely gruesome and I probably can't show them. So instead, I will play the 911 call made by the Heralds as Nash was being attacked by Travis the Chimp. And you can hear the chimp in the video going absolutely crazy. Your friend. Yes. She, he ripped your part. Hurry up! With a gun. Hurry up, please! 
There's someone on the way. Who God praise you, showed him. What is the monkey doing? Tell me what the monkey's doing. Oh, he, he ripped her face off. He ripped her face off? He tried to attack me. Please, please, okay, hurry. I need you to calm down a little bit. They're on the way. Can you push yourself away? I don't want okay, remember that girl that asked to get off the plane because she said the person next to her wasn't human? Well, the video I'm about to show you, she says exactly what she saw. And it's absolutely terrifying. Probably not going to make it. So, what happened on the flight? Finally, someone drops the question right. So, we weren't there. So, what happened on the flight? Well, the asshole beside me, I switched seats with. Okay. Was it the gentleman that was sitting right there with you? Inside? I switched seats with him, thinking, like, it was going to be a good idea. Yeah. Then he stole my AirPods, and then he, like, had his face up, and I tried to talk to him, and he wouldn't. He had what? So are you... And that other male, the one that got escorted out? Oh, no, the other male never got escorted out. Yeah. Yes, I did, because I said I wasn't comfortable being on that flight with him. You know, she did just push him basically on his choice. Getting all this. Are you having all on screen record, please? Yeah. What's your plan, man? Nothing. What do you see what happens? What do you mean? I'm, what do you mean? See what happens with what? What's your plan from here? I'm going home. I'm not So you have somebody come to pick you up or Uber, Does Lyft? It well, yes, because obviously we just got reports that you assaulted somebody by pushing the gentleman inside, okay? Wait, I assaulted someone? That's what multiple people okay, reported. So I'm, okay, I'm so hold on, to, hold wait, on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm okay. 5'2", 120 pounds. Okay, can you let five me finish? 5'2", 120 pounds. Can you let me finish? Yeah. So the gentleman is not wanting to press charges, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. So regardless, he's not wanting to press Wait. charges. Hey, could I hurt okay. you? How tall are you? How so with that you? being said... How tall are you? Could I hurt you? So with that being said... Exactly. How do you plan on getting home? Because you can't hang out here. If you have no business at the airport, you can't be here. I don't want to... Okay, so who's coming to pick you up? An Uber. Okay, have you already Last requested it? I will gladly press. Set alight and burned alive by his own mother, Andre was just eight years old when he was murdered, with his 12-year-old sister witnessing the whole thing. It was March 2021 in Russia, and Andre's mother Anastasia was having an affair. Andre had witnessed the visit from this man, and when his stepdad returned home, he told him everything. There was a text message on Anastasia's phone sent to another man that said, I'm married to one man, but in love with another. And this was just the proof that her husband needed to believe Andre. Anastasia flew into a rage and after holding Andre's hand over an open flame on their stove, she took him outside and doused him in petrol. According to Andre's 12 year old sister, Natasha, the petrol was poured over Andre's head and it was filling up his mouth. He was asking his mum to stop as she lit the matches. She lit three, which failed to take light, but the fourth one did, and she threw it towards his jumper and set him alight. He ran into the garden, engulfed in flames, and fell to his hands and knees. This is when Anastasia says she ran over and tried to put the flames out with snow. However, her 12-year-old daughter has a different story. Natasha said that after lighting the match, her mother said to her, let's watch how the scarecrow burns, and she had to stand there and watch as her eight-year-old brother was burned alive. Her stepdad then came running out of the house and put the fire out. Andre was rushed to hospital with horrific burns all over his head and body. He died the next day while being transferred to a specialist burns unit. Anastasia was arrested and was asked to reenact exactly what she did to her son. Да, вот сбоку получается. Сколько при примерно? Примерно не больше 200 грамм. Взяла спички. Ну, под поджигайте спички. Демонстрируйте, как оно было. То есть, 
Вот сейчас спичка загорелась, mm -hmm. а у меня три спички не загорелось, загорелась только четвертая. Mm -hmm. И держа вот так вот спичку, четвертая, просто загорелась кофта у ребенка. Я бросила спичку, у меня ребенок начал убегать в огород. Анастасия denied the murder of Andre, saying that she only wanted to scare him. В умышленном убийстве нет, конечно же. А, напугать, но не убивать ребенка. Я не желала своему ребенку смерти. Так, значит, было суждено и ему, и мне. She was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Her daughter Natasha is now in the foster care system. This politician took his own life on live TV. This is Robert Bud Dyer, and he was an American politician who ended his own life in a live press conference. In the early 1980s, Pennsylvania discovered that its state workers had overpaid federal taxes due to errors in state withholding prior to Dyer's administration. A multi-million dollar recovery contract was required to determine the compensation to be given to each employee. In 1986, Dyer was convicted of accepting a bribe from Computer Technology Associates, a California-based firm, to award them the contract, he was found guilty on 11 counts of conspiracy, mail fraud, perjury, and interstate transportation in aid of racketeering. And Robert Bud Dyer was scheduled to be sentenced on January 23, 1987, but on January 22, Robert Dyer called a news conference in the Pennsylvania State Capitol building in Harrisburg, during which he fatally shot himself ending his own life with a 357 Magnum revolver in front of reporters. This was then broadcasted later that day to a wide television audience across Pennsylvania. And I'm going to explain the whole thing right now. After Dyer finished speaking at the news conference, he pulled out an envelope with a model 357 Magnum revolver in it. And when the crowd in the room saw what Dyer pulled out of the envelope, the mood changed immediately. The question on everyone's mind was no longer whether or not Dyer would resign, but what he planned on doing with the firearm. Inside the room, people gasped and Dyer backed up against the wall, holding the weapon close to his body. Dyer then calmly said, please, please leave the room if this will affect you. Among those people who stayed, some pleaded with Dyer to surrender the gun while others tried to approach him and seize the weapon. However, Dyer warned against either action, exclaiming his last words, don't, 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 this will hurt someone. Robert Dyer then quickly put the muzzle of the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Firing a shot through the roof of his mouth and into his brain, he collapsed on the floor dead. Blood ran out through the back of his head and through his nose. Nine news cameras recorded the events and one of the cameras remained focused on Dyer and captured close-up footage of the aftermath of the shooting. As his body was slumped and blood strewn from the exit wound in the back of his head, as well as from his nostrils and mouth. He died instantly from the gunshot shortly before 11 a.m., but was not pronounced dead until 11.31 a.m. This is definitely one of the craziest things to ever happen on live TV, and what's even crazier is that the footage is still out there. I don't recommend searching or looking for this video because it does depict extremely disturbing things that might be unsettling the people. Can you just imagine watching this in 1987 expecting a normal news conference, and then something like this happens? Beautiful Finley Burden was taken into care at just three days old. Ten months later, he was given back to his parents. And after 39 days in their care, in the early hours of his first Christmas morning, he was murdered. Quick trigger warning, there is a description of Finley's injuries in the video, and they are horrific. Stephen Burden, 30, and Shannon Marsden, 22, were drug users and lived in a squalid home that you wouldn't even house an animal in. There was filthy bedding, filthy clothing, an unusable bathroom, and rotting food in the kitchen. There were also signs of drug use scattered around the house. Stephen and Shannon were 24 and 17 when their relationship began, and when Shannon fell pregnant, child protection concerns meant that her baby would be taken into care shortly after being born, as they were not fit to be parents. Finley was born in February 2020 and taken into care at three days old. However, in October 2020, he was given back to his parents over an eight-week period, despite social workers asking for a longer transition. Family courts decided that Finlay should be given back to his parents under an eight-week plan, including unsupervised visits and overnight stays of varying durations. On November 17th, Finlay was placed back into his parents' care permanently. 
Over the next 10 days in November, there were three visits by social workers. And on December 23rd, a social worker visited the house but was refused entry. Two days later, Finlay was murdered. The couple waited a whole hour after Finlay's death to call for an ambulance, as Stephen needed to hide his drugs. Finlay's autopsy showed a catalogue of horrific injuries. He had 57 fractures to his bones, including 45 rib fractures, a broken shoulder, a broken arm, a broken shin bone, his thigh was broken in four places, and his pelvis was broken in two places after being stamped on. He also had several burn marks from a hot, flat surface and a cigarette lighter and 130 bruises all over his tiny body. He'd also developed pneumonia, endocarditis, inflammation of the lining of the heart and sepsis. This wasn't a quick accidental death. It was a long, drawn-out, painful process for Finlay, inflicted by the two people that he should have relied on for protection. A search of the couple's internet history showed some really disturbing things. Just before Finlay had been returned to them, they'd read a story about a father that had been charged for killing his two-month-old son. Another was a woman that had been charged for killing her 20-month-old daughter through neglect. There were lots more similar searches leading right up to Finlay's death. Stephen and Shannon both denied murder, but due to the overwhelming evidence, a jury found them both guilty in April 2023, and they'll be sentenced at a later date. They showed absolutely zero emotion as they were found guilty. This is Gary Glitter, one of the worst pedophiles in world history. And this guy was a rock star. This story is extremely disturbing. So all the bad things that Gary Glitter had done in the past resurfaced in 2019 when the Joker came out. His song was the one that was used during this infamous dancing stairway scene. But let's rewind. Paul Francis Gad was born in 1944 in England. It was in the year 1971 during the glam rock movement when Paul began to use the stage name Gary Glitter and his career really took off. The release of his album titled Glitter was a massive success. The song Rock and Roll reached high points on all charts across the world and he seemed to be this, you know, new age progressive rock and roll star. And for years, Gary was heralded as a rock and roll icon. This guy was loved by thousands, millions of people across the planet. But that would all change in the year 1997 when Gary took his computer into a repair shop in England. The technician at the time that was taking a look at Gary's laptop discovered CP images on his hard drive. The police then got involved, they searched his home and found even more CP. This guy was sick. After all was said and done, it was discovered that Gary had downloaded over 4,000 images of CP onto his computer. He had also had a relationship with a 14-year-old girl in the 1970s and he was given a four-month prison sentence. After he was released from prison, Gary felt the heat from the public now hating him in England, so he fled to another country. But after the authorities in Cambodia discovered who he was, he was exposed and he was then deported to Bangkok. He eventually settled though in Vietnam. And it was in Vietnam where Gary resumed his typical pedo behaviors. He was banned from a nightclub for groping a teenage waitress. Other people saw him bringing two young girls into his home. And on November 12, 2005, Gary fled his home in Vietnam. Authorities eventually searched the place and found a 15-year-old girl that was living with him. He then tried to escape the country, but he was arrested at the airport. And from that point on, multiple Vietnamese girls came forward that were underage and said that Gary Glitter had, you know, assaulted them in the past. After all was said and done, he was sentenced to about three years in prison in Vietnam. And if he would have been convicted on all the charges that he faced, he might have been executed by firing squad. Eventually, though, he served his sentence and he was released in Vietnam, and after a lot of countries said they wouldn't let Gary Glitter in, he returned home to the UK. But he wasn't safe there. He was arrested shortly after arriving back in the UK after he faced a number of new allegations against him. Eventually, he was charged with eight counts of sexual offenses against girls from the ages of 12 to 14 in the years 1977 to 1980. One of these charges alleged that he even crept into a 10-year-old girl's bed and attempted to essay her. So after a lengthy trial, he was finally caught again. He was imprisoned, but he could be released next year in 2023. I know that the movie The Joker received a lot of backlash for using Gary Glitter's song because he was compensated with royalties, even after all of these things had happened to him. And yeah, this just shows that this guy was not and is not a good dude. Killer accidentally admitted to his crimes by accident when he forgot he was wearing a microphone while taking part in a documentary. This is how a true crime documentary exposed a killer. In 1971, Robert Durst met Kathleen McCormack and they got married. At the time of her disappearance in 1982, Kathleen had nearly graduated college. 
She was last seen by a witness at a dinner party where she appeared to be upset. She got a call from Robert and left. Robert admitted to having argued with Kathleen that night, but he said he put her on a train to New York and then never saw her again. Her friend called police to report her missing. Interestingly, Kathleen had been treated at a medical center for facial bruises weeks prior to this and told the friend that Robert had done it. Robert had actually been dating someone else for some time prior to this and had been living separately to Kathleen. When her family broke into her cottage to try and find out where she was, they found the place had been trashed and her possessions put in the bin. Kathleen's family always believed that Robert was involved in her disappearance. In 2000, Susan Berman, a friend of Robert's, was found murdered. Now, she'd actually provided Robert with an alibi for Kathleen's disappearance. Now, pay really close attention to this next bit. Days after she was killed, a letter addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department contained Susan's address and the word cadaver on it. On the envelope, Beverly was misspelled. Robert admitted in 2005 that Susan had called him shortly before her death to say that the police wanted to question her about Kathleen going missing. It's believed that Robert killed Susan to keep her quiet. In 2001, Robert's neighbor's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Robert's elderly neighbor, Morris Black, had been killed and Robert was arrested. He was actually released on bail and fled and was found about a month later in Pennsylvania. He was found with $37,000 cash, two weapons, and interestingly, Morris Black's driving license. In court, Robert claimed he was acting in self-defense. He said he'd accidentally shot Morris and dismembered his body. Due to lack of forensics, he only got five years in jail. This is where things get really crazy. HBO was filming a documentary called The Jinx. During production, Susan's stepson found a letter written by Robert. This contained the same spelling error in the word Beverly as the anonymous letter to police. This implicated Robert in the murder. Now, while filming the documentary, Robert needed the toilet. He forgot that he had a microphone still attached to him. He was recorded talking to himself. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. And then he said, what a disaster. He was right, I was wrong. And finally, he said, I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. Family of this missing girl found out via the media that she'd been murdered, butchered and sold as kebab meat. This case will put you off ever eating a kebab again. Charlene Downs disappeared aged just 14 years old in November 2003. She was living in Blackpool, UK and was last seen in an area containing many kebab shops and takeaways. While out with her friends one night, Charlene bumped into her mum. Her mum said that Charlene needed to be home by 10pm that night, which was quite typical for Charlene. Tragically, this would be the last time that her mum would ever see Charlene alive. When Charlene didn't turn up by 10pm, her dad went out on his bike looking for her for around half an hour. When he couldn't find her, he just presumed that she'd stayed over at her friend's house and went home and went to sleep. When she still didn't arrive the next morning, her parents started to get worried and they called police. Police, however, said that they could not report this as a missing person until she'd been missing for 48 hours. Eventually, police did start to look for her, but they said that they presumed she was a runaway. The case went cold until three years later. Charlene's family were called into a police station. There was news of two men who had been arrested linked with a local takeaway called Funny Boys. They were arrested on suspicion of murder and disposal of Charlene. This is when the family found out some shocking news via the media about what had happened to Charlene. An article published stated that she had been grinded up and sold as kebab meat. One of the brothers of the men who had been arrested had heard them bragging about doing this. Now, Charlene's disappearance actually unearthed the fact that these takeaways were being used as a front for pee rings, where men were luring teenagers in with food and alcohol in exchange for things I cannot repeat on this app. When the case against these two men went to trial, the jury failed to reach a verdict. The case was then thrown out of court due to apparent lack of physical evidence. One of the reasons for this is how well Charlene's body had obviously been disposed of. Both men who had been charged were given a quarter of a million pounds compensation for being falsely trialed. Around a week after the trial, Charlene's mum was actually arrested for stabbing her husband. 
He declined to press charges saying that he knew she had been stressed. Members of the family were also charged with racially aggravated assault against the brother of the man who'd been charged with murder and also punching the man who'd been charged with helping dispose of her body. In August 2017, police arrested a 51-year-old man who lived in Blackpool at the time of Charlene's disappearance. This was on suspicion of murdering her. However, he was released just two days later. We still have no justice for Charlene and nobody is behind bars for her killing.